All right, everybody, this is Ross. Welcome back to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night, 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, and a lot about figs. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in tonight's episode of Fruit Talk. Once again, we will have a discussion on figs. And um, essentially what I have... Uh, come up with is a pretty decent plan uh, or decent thoughts about my end of the end of my season really um, I'm gonna try my hardest in the next few weeks of the uh, of the podcast to talk about other topics other than figs but uh, for this week we're gonna try to really wrap up the season in one uh, in one video or maybe I'll do a couple of videos throughout uh, the course of time on my YouTube channel. Um, but in terms of the podcast here, we'll kind of try to wrap this up the best I can. Um, I do want to talk about a couple other topics first. So uh, if you guys remember, um, last week we talked about mushrooms. We had a video that we saw on YouTube that was put out by North Spore, a company who uh, really specializes in mushrooms and um, propagating mushrooms and um they sell all kinds of grain spawn and sawdust spawn and plugs and and different things like that of, of different uh, species of mushrooms. And they had a nice video uh, just really laying out um, some good groundwork for how you could garden with mushrooms. And I thought it was a really, really interesting topic. We talked about last week, or at least the last episode, how to really use some of those techniques in, in a more practical setting because I as interesting as it all was in that video I didn't think all of it was really all that practical um, I think a lot of it depends on where you live and what techniques of growing you are using and there's just so much I think uh, to it that you just really can't say it's gonna work for everybody and I went ahead and I decided to actually purchase um, some of the some of the mushroom spawn um, from North Spore to try it to try it myself try different techniques so there's two different techniques that we are gonna go with that sort of came from that video um, one is kind of already one that I'm already doing um, so it's not necessarily all that new to me uh, because what we have right now is actually our wine caps and we're growing them in wood chips and uh, those wood chips are around perennials. You know, that's a pretty solid, easy way to garden and not technically, I guess you can call it gardening, but really growing any sort of perennial with uh, with mushrooms um, is just really a no brainer. It makes a whole lot of sense. You know, you got perennials, the best way to constantly feed your perennials and and um, get them to uh, a healthier state and have them more nutrients and maybe even have the, the food taste better is to actually lay down some mulch and some material every year um, or even just put down a lot of material in one year and have that break down over time so we put down a lot of wood chips um, last year and we inoculated that area with wine cap mushrooms and and they're actually been doing really well in the spring. It was so dry here throughout most of the year that it's finally taken just now that they're actually producing. So um, I don't know how much longer in the length of this fall that they're going to continue to produce wine caps, but uh, I'm happy to be getting them, you know. Um, and also I think um, we can do the same thing, the same technique basically, but just with a different material and a different mushroom. So instead of wine caps on wood chips, you have um, oyster mushrooms on straw. And it's just really the same thing. I realized that I'm going to do the cut and cover method once again for the fig trees uh, for the winter protection this year. And essentially that method's really simple where you cut the fig trees all the way down to 6 to 12 inches off the ground. So you cut them back really hard. You cover them with uh, lots of straw and then over top of the straw goes tarps and then you tie down the tarps with heavy objects to uh, keep the tarps from blowing away and that really helps insulate 
uh, the earth because the earth is a heat source and it's a really nice method. Um, I've become a big fan of that method. But what you need to do every year is actually get straw. So I have to go to a local farm. Um, I'm going to pick up probably three to four bales of straw and that usually that's enough to cover the figs and cover the areas of whatever I need. Plus in the past I've grown potatoes with straw um, where we essentially put the potatoes in the ground and cover them with lots of straw to help hill the soil, um, hill the hill the plants with the straw and also keep the straw or keep the, the potatoes from getting uh, hit by sunlight. So it really does a nice job, I think, of growing potatoes that way. Um, <clears throat> perhaps that little technique needs to be adjusted in some little way. Maybe it should be done in a raised bed, but the the point is is that we're not really going to be doing the potatoes, at least I don't think. Uh, we will talk about our garden plants probably in a future episode of Fruit Talk. Well, for sure we're going to talk about that, but um, we definitely don't need nearly as much straw. I don't really have as many uses for the straw as I normally do, and even last year, at the end of the season when I uncovered the figs, I had all this excess straw and I actually bagged it all up and put it in the trash bags and then put it underneath uh, the sunroom in a storage area and just kept it there. So I actually have some leftover straw, even from last year, um, to use for the figs this year. So with all this excess straw, I'm like, well, what am I going to do with it? You know, if I'm not growing the potatoes, I'm, I don't really have the greatest of use for it. Really, the only place that I can put it and, and make use of it is to put it underneath perennials, just like wood chips, have that stuff break down. Straw is really great because it has a lot of silica in it, um, and that is really beneficial, I think, for the natural disease resistance and, uh, and pest resistance, overall health of, uh, of any perennial. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. So we're going to put that down just like we do the, the, the wood chips, but why not just inoculate it, right? It doesn't make sense not to. So we're going to do it again, just like that. The same way I would do my wine cap <clears throat> is inoculate that straw with different types of oyster mushrooms. And I think I settled on the, uh, the pink oyster here and also the, uh, I think it's the Italian oyster down here. Yes. So one of them, the pink oyster actually requires warmer temperatures to fruit so this will be a nice gap in my season I actually ordered two bags of those which we're gonna use for a different method I'll talk about in a second but I think it's nice because those will hopefully fingers crossed if I inoculate them in the early early spring because what's gonna end up happening is the figs are gonna be uncovered in March I put up the low tunnels take off the tarps move the straw away um, so the straw is going to be free sometime in very early March. So if I have all this excess straw, I can then lay that underneath the fruit trees and inoculate it. Um, so that's what we're going to do is, is really inoculate that with two different types, as I mentioned. So the, the pink oyster is, again, hopefully in the summer. And then the Italian oyster is kind of like in a similar time of the year as the wine caps, I imagine. Maybe the wine caps will continue to produce all year, uh, assuming it's wet. This year it just was very dry, and that's kind of why I'm just now getting some mushrooms after getting a, a crazy amount in the spring. Um, so maybe in a, in a wet year I might get some wine caps all year. I've heard that's actually a possibility and, and usually what would happen. But it would be nice, I think, to have a different type of mushroom in the summer, which is kind of where the pink oyster comes in. And then the Italian oyster is going to just basically be, um, you know, in the spring and in the fall and, you know, whatever. So I think personally, it's probably a really, um, really good idea to have different types of mushrooms that hopefully can fill a larger gap of your, of your season. Um, so yeah, that, that's one that we're going to do. And I was really quite interested to read and, and learn that the pink oyster mushroom is just a mushroom that requires higher temperatures. You know, I didn't know that that was a thing or that this was going to be a possibility, I guess, at least in terms of growing something on straw or growing something on wood chips. You know, I always 
at least when I think of mushrooms, I think of growing them in the shade and, <laughs> and growing them in a colder, cooler area that really has a lot of moisture. Um, so the other way I'm going to use this mushroom is a totally different and new way of growing mushrooms that was also featured in that video by North Spore. And I don't really know how much success I'm going to have which is essentially growing them in my one of my raised garden beds. And you essentially, in the video, they at least created the bed. They had the walls of the bed of logs inoculated with shiitake, which I thought was cool. But uh, in the actual bed, they filled, it, they filled it in with soil, and then they inoculated the soil, all that organic material, with the oyster mushroom. And I think that's... I think it's really, really cool. I, I, I have to say, if that, if that can work... I don't know if it's really going to work. Um, it just seems like you got to have a bed that's really quite moist at all times um, because the pink oyster, like I said, it needs those warmer temperatures in the soil. I think I read somewhere it needs something like 60 to 80 degrees in the soil or something. Um, so if you don't have warmer soil temperatures, it just won't fruit. Um which kind of is maybe a contradiction with the straw because if the straw is down on the ground, you would think it's going to cool down the soil and you probably wouldn't reach those temperatures at least very easily or for a very long time. I don't know. Um, I'm less worried about that method and more worried about just inoculating this in my soil that's bare and that dries out You know, probably sometime in July and maybe parts of June and pr parts of August as well. And that's supposed to be when it fruits, right? So it kind of just seems like a giant contradiction to me um, is that it's supposed to fruit in the summer, but in the summer it's quite dry. So ah, I don't know. I don't know, guys. I don't know if it's going to work, but I'll tell you it's interesting. I want to see if it is going to work. Maybe, you know, I'll have to water the beds every once in a while or the particular bed I'm gonna have this mushroom in. And I guess I can make a judgment call at some point in the summer and say, all right, well, is it a dry summer? You know, are the mushrooms not spawning? And then make a judgment call from there, I guess. Um, but certainly I have no doubt that the, the straw beds will probably work. Um, and then this will just be something really cool that potentially I could do in the future and maybe even inoculate a lot of my soil. You know, um, each year you're supposed to put down layers of compost and I don't always get around to that, but it would be a really nifty, great way to make more use out of my space to grow more food. And um, I just think if you can kind of grow it all together, it just makes a whole lot of sense to me. And you know what they also mentioned in the video and it, it does make sense is that that grain spawn is adding some nutrients and the fact that the mushrooms are breaking down some of that organic material you know it really does help um, add fertility you know one of the things that is so special about the wine cap uh, Paul Stamets has said in the past that it actually really improves the soil of wherever you have inoculated that particular mushroom so it's kind of just really interesting and it'd be really cool, I think, to see how this all works together. I mean, nature is just so amazing. Um, one of the other things here I want to talk to you guys about before we get into the figs is actually um, a little bit about food. We have recently gone um, gluten-free. And here's actually some pasta I made. Uh, we first started out with some vegetables. We had... Um, some shiitake mushrooms, some leeks, some uh, fennel stalk, some garlic, and we just sauteed this up with some olive oil in the in the uh, in the wok, and then I added in some cherry tomatoes. I had some black cherry, some sun gold in there. Plus, we had some homegrown and homemade pesto, half carrot top, half basil. Got the Parmesan cheese in there. Then we um, obviously mixed that all together and added in some chicken stock and also uh, some of the pasta water that was salted. And then we added in the pasta, mixed it all up together, and it just came out really, really good. Um, this was, though, some of the first pasta I had had in, like, I don't know, over a week. 
because I recently, as I said, have gone have gone gluten free, and I cannot really stress it enough. I think how amazing I feel um, having gone gluten free. And there's other things I've done. Like I mostly don't eat dairy now. Uh, the Parmesan cheese was kind of just in the pesto and I had no choice, but um, I haven't eaten really any dairy for the most part in the last, I don't know, 12, 13 ish days. Haven't eaten any gluten. Um, trying not to eat really any corn products. Um, trying to eat a lot less processed oils. Um, not that I eat a whole lot of the stuff to begin with, but uh, really trying to eliminate even soy um, from my diet. I also have a food sensitivity to eggs, so I haven't really been eating all these eggs. I mean, not that I this I mean I haven't been eating eggs in years for the most part, but you know it really does go to show you that. Um, just these little changes in your diet can go an extremely long way. And I'll tell you that um, it has been amazing, the, particularly the gluten, I feel. And I feel, just a, I feel as good as I did probably in my early 20s when at that point you're basically indestructible. I mean, nothing can really bother your health for most of your, uh, most of your younger years. Um, and then since I started, I guess, getting in more into food, I started branching out and eating worse, really. Uh, and I wasn't, you know, everything was more about the flavor and, and how everything tastes and you know, less about uh, being healthy, I guess. But not that I wasn't being healthy, I think. But if you have a sensitivity to gluten, which I have not really confirmed with a doctor, but I'll tell you that... Um, I feel so good off of gluten that it must be it must be true. Um, I must have some sort of sensitivity, and I've read really well on this topic. Um, there there is a doctor, uh, a functional medicine doctor, which, by the way, um, functional medicine seems to be way more beneficial um, for a lot of us than your maybe your traditional doctor. Not that there isn't a place for traditional medicine. Um, because obviously that saves a ton of lives every year. But um, functional medicine, really, if you don't know what that is, is really looking at the root cause of the problem. So if you have inflammation, well, what's the cause of the inflammation? You know, um, if you have uh, Alzheimer's, what was the cause of Alzheimer's? Rather than a traditional doctor giving you something because you had a heart attack or giving you something because you're developing dementia or something, what is the root cause of this? Instead of putting a Band-Aid on the problem every single year, we're going to look at why this is happening, why you have these symptoms to then form a diagnosis to then actually cure um, the symptoms or cure the, uh, the root cause of the problem. And to me, that makes so much sense. I don't know why anybody would think otherwise. I always thought that's how traditional doctors think. <laughs> I thought that's what they were doing. Um, but I guess they're not, uh, at least most of them. They diagnose your problem, and then basically from there, they just stop thinking. They put together a bunch of symptoms that you have and then form a diagnosis and then say, oh, you have blank, right? And most of the time, they might not even be right about what you have. So uh, it's kind of crazy to me, the whole medical system. And, and I, I honestly believe that you have to be your own doctor. You know, um, of course, yes, I should get tested for celiacs and see if I have some sort of sensitivity to gluten. But, you know, I've done the research. I've learned that even just getting a test of all these different things isn't necessarily going to prove that you have, you have it or don't have it. You know, um, I've learned that at least through food sensitivities, really the only way to really know is if you actually do some elimination in your diet. Um, it's really the best way to know. Um, if you're, you have a sensitivity to eggs, there's very few tests that are going to be like, oh, you have an egg sensitivity. You know, I just know from years of eating eggs from the time I was a kid that I've always felt kind of queasy after eating eggs. So, um, you know, you, if you eliminate that, you don't feel queasy, then 
I mean, that must be it, right? You must have some sort of sensitivity. If I'm getting gas after eating dairy, then I must be lactose intolerant. If I stop eating the, the dairy and I don't have gas, then that must be it, right? So um, I don't know how much stock you really can put into some of these tests related to your gut, related to certain things that uh, revolve around these sensitivities and things like that. There are many different tests and maybe one of them is more beneficial than, I'm sure some of them are more beneficial than the others, but can you defi can someone definitively tell me exactly how sensitive I am to gluten? I don't know. Um, and to me, I don't really care to know, but I'll tell you that you need to be your own doctor. Um, everybody needs to be their own doctor because you're the person who cares about you more than anybody else. So if you're, you're going to be your best advocate, you're going to be your best doctor. You're going to be the guy that is going to figure it out uh, because you're the one that actually has the passion and the care and the love of yourself to find out what's wrong with you. Um, I'll tell you what, you go to the doctor and you tell them you have a bunch of problems and they don't know what the problem is. They're not going to be up all night thinking about what it is that's wrong with you. <laughs> you know, they have many, many patients. So, um, you're going to have to be that person. You're going to have to be that one to brainstorm and bounce ideas off other people and look and try to find out what the information is that's really true. Because um, we're not doctors, most of us. I mean, sure, there's some of you guys out there that are doctors, but um, I, I think there's some really good um, just things that, that have happened throughout my life. I'm only 29 years old, and I've had to see a doctor for a number of different issues and most of the issues I've had, the doctor didn't have any idea what was wrong with me. So um, I think it's um, really in everyone's best interest, especially if you're deathly ill. I mean, of course, you probably want to see multiple doctors in that situation. And you also want to be your best, your own advocate um, to help figure out what this is. Um, now, if you're not a doctor like myself you're going to want to go and try to find the best information that you possibly can. And as you know, the amount of information on the internet is insane, um, almost to a crazy extent to where there's too much information. And there's actually so much information that a lot of it's misleading. A lot of it's wrong. Uh, a lot of it is purposely trying to mislead you. Some of it is just, um, I guess you could say ignorant or, um, People just don't have, you know, they're, they're putting information out there potentially for even just the wrong reasons. So if you're looking at a doctor, let's say on the internet, that's putting out information on a particular topic, who's to say really they're correct? Um, it really, I think the most, the leading indicator of trying to find an expert in anything, regardless if it's a doctor, regardless if it's somebody who grows figs, <laughs> is if they have... Uh, really put the time in to figure out what the problems are and have actually maybe even lived some of this stuff, um, have gone through it themselves, have put in so many hours and countless time and passion. They have the passion to then find out what the answer is. If they don't know what the answer is, they're going to go out and they're going to find out what the answer is. Um, you know, I think that's extremely, extremely important. Um, Man, I could probably go on and on about that particular thing of finding that right expert because there's many people who c can call themselves experts, but just because you know one guy is reviewing figs and the other guy is reviewing figs doesn't mean that they all know what they're talking about. You know, just because I'm a doctor doesn't mean I'm intelligent. Doesn't mean I um I know what I'm doing. You know, there's I'll give you an example. There are just if you look at your own profession, whatever it is that you do. How many people within your profession, maybe even you, are just not good at your job? I mean, it's possible, right? Uh, there's plenty of people who are not good at their job. There's plenty of people who are also good at their job. And there's probably just as many people who are about average at their job. So if you're looking at a doctor, let's say, and you're getting information from a doctor who is either average at their job or bad at their job, then you're just going to have the wrong information. You're going to be running around in circles thinking, oh, this person's a doctor. They went to school for 8, 20 years, and uh, they must have a high IQ because they went to school at Harvard or someplace. That's not always true. 
You know, it's just not. And um, it, it just is a, a, it's a, literally a fact. I mean, I don't know what the statistic is, but there is a huge number of people in the world who are just not good at their jobs, no matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's being a doctor or being a trash man. You know, um, it just is, it's just a proven thing. So, um, if you're going to be finding this information, you're going to be looking for information. You're going to be trusting your uh, your um, uh, you're going to be trusting somebody on the internet. You have to trust the right person. It's really that simple. Um, whether that's someone on the internet or it's your actual doctor, you got to know who it is that you're you're actually listening to. And and not only that, but of course, form your own opinion. You know. I don't think anybody is, is suggesting here blindly follow somebody because they are an expert. You know, um, I tell you guys that all the time. Just because I've been doing this for a long time, and I put a lot of hours into growing figs, that you know you shouldn't always just trust everything I have to say. You know, people can be wrong. Um, people are wrong. I am wrong plenty of times. So uh, the the point I'm here I'm trying to make here, guys, is that I do genuinely um really do think that gluten is a serious issue for a lot of people i've really put a lot of research into this and I've listened to a lot of different people and what they've had to say on this topic and um i can tell you without a doubt that i have felt so good without eat with just stopping eating gluten and um it's it's affected many aspects of my life not just um digestion you know um i feel like i have less inflammation um i think it really it all starts in your gut personally and um you know if you essentially have a better microbiome less gut problems it then leads to a whole host of other different things that are then better i mean your mind your body my skin um my metabolism um my allergies have cleared up uh, for the most part. Um, I'm happier. I have less anxiety. Um, you know, your mind is connected to your gut. So if you basically have an unhealthy gut, you're going to have an unhealthy mind. So it's really insane. It really is insane. Um, and I don't normally talk about this kind of stuff here on the podcast. You know, we talk about fruit and vegetables, guys. Um, but we don't normally talk about the health side of all of this and uh it just really is quite amazing what i've learned and uh really have experienced for myself over the last um really hasn't been that long maybe two weeks and it was almost like a night and day change from when i stopped eating gluten stopped eating dairy um i still eat corn here and there but i'm trying not to um it's just a, it really is an, an incredible difference. And I think if anybody out there is unhealthy and you've been struggling your whole life to become healthy, it's probably one of the best places to start is to stop eating dairy, stop eating gluten. Um, probably, you know, even limit the amount of meat that you eat. If you eat a ton of meat, um, I don't think really the carnivore diet, at least from what I've learned uh, through this research I've been doing, doesn't seem like that's a great idea either. Um, you know, I know there's people who probably feel a lot better on, you know, eating something like a carnivore diet. But why is that? Is that because of the gluten? Is that because you're no longer eating things that really were bothering you? Um, so I would try some sort of elimination diet. That's really my best advice. And I think anybody, really anybody out there who is sick with anything, I think you could probably point to something in your stomach that um is probably affecting it but yeah whatever that's just some philosophy that i have no factual basis behind but anyway um yeah that's my recommendation is that if you you know i think if you guys might not even think you have celiacs maybe you have some sort of sensitivity to it and it might just be worth checking out so Let's move on now to the figs um, before I, you know, quit my job and try to become a doctor. But um, all right, so we we're at the end of the season here. The end of our season is pretty much it's pretty much over now, and um, 
the figs really it's just too cold at this point we've talked really been talking about this for like the last month is that things are really winding down but i actually do genuinely think it's just over at this point there's very little metabolic uh the metabolisms of the trees are very very low at this point uh ripening is taking an extremely long time i don't have any trees in the greenhouse this year to extend the season um largely the season has been i guess in a nutshell a, a learning experience um mostly a disappointment due to trying different techniques uh trying different things that really just end, it didn't end up working out and kind of reaffirmed my beliefs of what i was doing prior and um Although in order to gain that knowledge, I had to fail. So I think I don't regret any of this. I actually think this was a good learning experience this year. But overall, it was mostly a disappointment. Um, a lot of the newer varieties that I had and, and um, have fruit on them, I never even really got a chance to try and evaluate. And um, that was kind of a shame in terms of trying something new. Um, I did try some new varieties, don't get me wrong. We got a better handle on some of the varieties that certainly have, um, I guess, been um, in my collection for a long time. I'm trying to just adjust the volume here a little bit. I think we're a little bit too loud. but um, So, yeah, it, it, the season, I guess, you know, in a nutshell, was not really a success, but we're better for it. It's, I think, really the point. Um, what we have here is kind of a, 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 we're looking at the spreadsheet for anyone that's interested. It's in the description of any of my videos on YouTube. You can always go there and, and check this out. Uh, what I'm looking at is the top performing figs uh, sheet. And I promised you guys that I would come back to you at the end of the year and I would put together my keepers, uh, or not really my keepers, but the best varieties that I grow and go over those. Um, I also have a list of keepers and I have a list of varieties that are uh, my runners up. Now the difference here, because I had some questions, the varieties in this section here in the early section, these are my best early varieties. This is the mid-season section. These are the best mid-season varieties, the best late varieties, the best very late variety. Um, and then of course the percentage of which of how many of each I should grow. Um, then there's also the keepers list, which are varieties that I think are phenomenal varieties that anybody would be happy with for the most part. Um, you may have to, you know, really, uh, try a bit harder for some of this stuff. Actually, I think white Madeira number one should probably be over here. Um, again, this, this list and really all of this list, I guess I could, should say this before we go through all of this is that. This can change very quickly, very frequently. It does. It always has. The recommendations I've made in the past, um, really since like 2017, I've really been making some um, high recommendations, I think. Maybe even 2018, I think we may have started. But I think the first varieties we've really recommended were, were Azores Dark, Smith, and Italian 258. And to this day, Azores Dark and Smith are still one of my best, some of my best varieties. Italian 258, it has nothing, it's not that it's a bad variety. In fact, I consider it a keeper here. In fact, I probably would even put, a, I probably would put Black Madeira in here as well. It's not that they're not, um, you know, they're, they're not a, they're not a, it's not that they're a bad recommendation. They're just not a good recommendation in terms of somebody who lives in a place like I do. Um, so probably really Italian 258, I think, is the better variety um, in terms of the Black Madeira types. It definitely beats out uh, Black Madeira and all the different weirdly named Black Madeiras. There is a Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross, which is coming into popularity. And that one, I think, actually will beat even the Italian 258. Another name for Italian 258 is uh, the Genovese Nero. Um, so, you know, it's not like I don't like Italian 258. It's just not something that most people in a humid place should be growing, especially if you're in a shorter season climate. Um, I think I will add Black Madeira to this list because uh, a friend of mine um, 
growing in Louisiana actually grows black Madeira and it's one of his favorite figs and he really knows what he's doing and um, he grows it in the ground and as I've mentioned many times and we've really learned this year is that by growing them in the ground they're less susceptible to splitting which is kind of the biggest issue with Italian 58 and black Madeira and I even harvested some Italian 58 this year for my in-ground tree and it also didn't split so pretty uh, amazing honestly what can happen with these with these trees um, over time is that they just kind of get themselves more dug in a bigger root system that's then less affected by uh, huge rain events so really really awesome I think that was a nice little learning thing that we learned this year um, we also learned this year I guess we could talk about some of the things we learned is that there needs to be an adequate amount of light penetration into the canopy uh, in order to have fruit set. If you do not have good light penetration, you have a very dense canopy, you just will not have fruit set. Um, they'll never set fruit. They just will not produce figs. It's not like they're, they're going to fall off. They were never there to begin with. Um, some other things we mentioned is that we do absolutely need to pinch here. Um, without a doubt is an extremely, extremely beneficial technique. Um, wanted to see exactly how beneficial it was. And I still have calculated um, about a 19 day difference between pinching and not pinching. Um, let's see, what else did we learn this year? Um, we did also learn a couple things in terms of uh, it might be beneficial to actually remove some leaves lower down on the canopy that are quite shaded, uh, also quite you know shading out some of the fruits. The fruits themselves, if they do not receive enough sunlight down below, it is also possible for them to drop fruit as well. So uh, I think it's a good idea as the tree gets taller and taller, is really start removing some of those lower leaves as the figs ripen. Um, you probably want to remove the leaves, anything below the next fig that has ripened. So um, not that I think we should be really removing tons of leaves. It's just some of the very, very lower leaves that could be shading out a large portion of the canopy. And that's really only for the in-ground trees. I wouldn't remove any of the leaves in a potted tree. That's definitely a mistake. Um, what else did we learn? Um, those, I think, were really the big one there. We learned about, I guess, some spacing potential issues that could be a problem. Uh, we learned the benefits, really, of Japanese espalier, for, the form of a Japanese espalier or a cordon system for figs, uh, and how that sort of relates to the light penetration, again, going into that canopy. Um, we learned, really solidified, I guess, the soil moisture thoughts that we had especially comparing the in-ground trees to the potted trees to regulating every ounce of water that goes into the the containers that we have um well there's probably a lot more that i'm not thinking of right now but i think those are the big ones uh oh we did also learn about the shape which we talked about i think a couple weeks ago in our our fruit talk where the shape really does largely determine the overall rain resistance, not rain resistance, split resistance of uh, particular varieties. Um, so if they have a more flatter shape or rounder shape, they're going to split more frequently than something that's shaped like an oval or something that's shaped like a teardrop, like you would um, kind of see something like a celeste. Excuse me, guys. A celeste is more of that teardrop, classic teardrop shape. So any of these really, really flat figs, for the most part, you're not going to see them in this category here. Um, any of the round figs, you're not really going to see them in this category here. These, almost every single one of these is a pyroform shape, like a teardrop, or is an ovoidal shape that's shaped like an oval. Um, there's one exception, which is actually the Borgia Soak Grease. And... Um, we did do a little bit of experimenting this year. Let's go into the varieties now. Uh, we did some experimenting with looking further into Violet Sapor, Bordeaux Soak Grease, Socorro Black, and I'm pretty darn confident that 
they're all basically the same. I have a feeling the Borgia Socaris is probably going to be the best of the bunch. So therefore, I'm, the, I'm that's the one that I'm going to go with, and that's the one I'm going to propagate the most of um, just going forward. Now, this is the only fig that I would consider having a your your seal lotto shape and uh, I don't know exactly how to pronounce this but here's a nice little photo your seal lotto this is the the uh, shape um, this is the the system of fig shapes that I think Estel rich has come up with and he I think is one of the major uh, fig growers from Spain back in the day and he has he has written some some books and things on figs as well and um, in addition to Pons I should say but this was taken right out of Pons's book which is the this particular system of naming them and even there's a even further than that of classifying them as a different shape there's a certain way to do it um, which I thought was pretty interesting that I had no idea how you do that but um, rather than just looking at the shape you can actually measure it and really figure it out for yourself um, based on actually measuring and I think you take you cut the fig in half minus the stem or something and that's what you're left with but um, I do also think the stem length has a lot to do with it if the, the stem is longer uh, you may have a let's say a your your ciolato shape that's not ideal this is quite flat quite round if you have this shape, but you have a long stem, it may actually work out. And that's sort of what I've been noticing with the Aspherica, which is uh, more of a round shape, really uh, spherical, that the Campaneri, as an example, is quite round as well, but it has a, such a long stem that actually it sort of avoids splitting for the most part. Where Ronde Bordeaux, which I've downgraded to a keeper, is also round. I mean, that's what... That's what rond means in French is round. Um, Bordeaux is the location, but it's a round fig, but it has a short stem, and therefore it splits quite often. Um, Pastelier, which is a fig that I think has a lot of potential, also is quite round, but it is known to be a splitter, but it does have a longer stem. So maybe if I can, if it can consistently have a longer stem, or I can find a, a strain of Pastelier with a longer stem, even though it has that round shape, I might be better off. You know, something that makes Celeste such an amazing, amazing fig is that it has a long stem and it has that pyroform shape that we look for to avoid splitting. It really has that teardrop-like shape. Now, the avoidal shape here, the classic one that I think about is actually Moro de Caneva. And it's avoidal just means oval. Um, here's actually some Campaneri that Kind of even has more of like a pyroform shape. But here's one right here that's, again, a spherical. And then if I go down to Moro de Caneva, you can really get an idea. Here's actually one right here. Very long stem, also oval-like shape. Um, give you a better idea here. Here's some right here. These are as oval as it gets for the most part. Um, extremely oval-like shaped fruits. And that's exactly why uh, I really am valuing the Ponte Tresa as well, because Ponte Tresa is also an oval-like shape. And um, I'm considering even putting the Ponte Tresa in the ground because it's going to have that higher rain resistance and split resistance that you need in most of your figs. I don't remember which of these is the Ponte Tresa. It might be this fig here. I don't remember here. Oh, it might be this one. I haven't named I haven't named some of these unfortunately. I have to go back and add some names to some of these guys. But um yeah, the the point is is that that's sort of really the characteristics of what we're valuing here is one the shape which then correlates to the split resistance, the overall rain resistance, which then um well, I should say really it's we're focusing on really two things. One is, as I said, the shape, which correlates to the split resistance. Two, which is the drying capabilities, which then correlates to the rain resistance. So the drying capabilities is going to indicate a huge amount of rain resistance, 
uh, because the rain's not going to affect the fig. It's going to have a higher enough bricks. It's probably not going to have a, low, a whole lot of cracking. It's also probably not going to split all that much. Um, and therefore, it's going to be able to withstand the humid weather here to produce a really high quality fruit. So all of this, the split resistance, the, the shape, um, the, uh, the drying capabilities, all of this then correlates really well to the flavor uh, to then form and have a consistently higher fruit quality. So then the last thing you kind of look at is, well, when does the fig ripen and how does it actually taste? When the fig is actually ripe, how does the fig taste? You can't get a ripe fig if it doesn't have good split resistance, good rain resistance here. So those are like the two biggest things that you have to think about first, rain resistance, split resistance. Then you think about the flavor. And, you know, also depending on when it rains in your climate, depending on when that bad weather comes in, you may want to have a fig that ripens at a particular time. Here, I may want to have a very early fig that ripens before our fall weather. Um, in Florida, you may want to have a very, very late fig that ripens after hurricane season. So it sort of depends on where you guys live. And that's really some big, important information that I've learned. And I wish I knew since day one. Um, that's really in a nutshell what I've learned about growing figs in a humid climate. So these are the figs here that are the best of the best. Again, this could change, but we haven't shied away from our Azores Dark, our Malta Black. They're hardy Chicago types. We've talked a huge length about them. They're very, very tasty. They taste quite different as well. Um, it's worth having both, in my opinion. Now, Celeste, we actually just did a little, we did a little um, blog post, actually, on our blog about Celeste. And there's so many different types of Celeste that, maybe it's on the second page here. Wow, it's been that long. Yeah, the many strains of Celeste, it's called figboss.com for anyone that's interested. But we have in this top section here, I actually originally thought there was different types of strains of Celeste. One was your typical Celeste. Others are Blue Celeste. Blue Celeste and Celeste, I think it's just pretty much the same thing. It's just that just like the Hardy Chicago types, there's different variations, mutations, adaptations different genetics at this point that have made these figs change in certain ways. And some of them actually have blue skin, like you see here. This one is uh, Violette de Marseille. And one of these strains of Celeste, I don't know which one it is, but it's going to become king. It's going to emerge as the better Celeste strain, and that is going to be the one that is certainly going to be in this particular list here. That is among the best fig varieties I grow. We've talked a lot about Celeste, and you could pretty much just guarantee across the board on all these varieties, just assume that it has extremely good rain resistance, split resistance, and again, has also really good flavor. So um, I think that could be really without saying, and I'm kind of just going to go over these varieties rather quickly. Campanieri is just, again, the same thing. I think it ripens extremely early, as early as Ron de Bordeaux. And it's very, very flavorful. I love the texture of that fig. Um, we just did a video on this. We just did a post on this um, on uh, our figs. We sh are probably going to post about it at some point on our blog. Moro de Caneva, again, extremely, extremely good fig. Um, can't really say enough about it. It has a huge, the longest stemmed fig of any fig I've ever seen. Campanieri has a long stem as well. Um, it's got the perfect shape. Um, it tastes fantastic. It can dry decently. Um, Campanieri has good drying capabilities as well. Azores Dark. Celeste has great drying capabilities. Malta Black has great drying capabilities. Almost every single one of these figs in this category has good drying capabilities other than maybe LSU Purple. So LSU Purple is just one of those figs, guys, that I think I still need a little bit more information on, unfortunately. So I have had uh, some figs off of my own tree that are quite good. Um, I definitely enjoy the variety. Um, I also know that from other growers, it's quite hardy, very rain resistant. It's uh, relatively early. Um, my only little grief about it is that the flavor may not be up to par as much as I think. And if that's the case, then 
eh, I think I'd rather just have Zafiro as an example. Um, so I think there's room for LSU Purple to fall off a cliff. <laughs> but I did have um, some LSU Purple off of a friend's tree that's actually uh, five miles down the road. And he has a tree in, in the ground that survives every year. And it's uh, it's pretty big. It's actually very productive. And believe it or not, it has um, very highly tasting fruits on it. The fruits um, taste great. But the fruits tasted very different in a way than, um, than my own tree. So, um, and I didn't necessarily like his fruits as much as I liked mine. Because at least mine had some sort of, uh, you know, a, a different feel to it. Um, whereas his kind of reminded me just of like your standard fig. It wasn't anything special about the flavor. Um, you know, I like to think of it as a, a honey fig uh, with caramel notes, maybe some brown sugar notes. And that just wasn't what I was picking up at his place. And I wonder if that's going to be the trend for me as well when I grow LSU purple um, in the ground. That's my plan is actually to plant, um, probably get some cuttings this winter time because I just don't have any cuttings off my tree for the most part. It's grafted and it doesn't grow very quickly because uh, there's other varieties that kind of take dominance over it. But um, I'm, I'm sure I have some cuttings. Maybe I can root myself, but the i the ideal scenario is to get enough just get a tree that i can plant in the ground um to then um actually have a more mature tree that's going to um eventually mature i mean i think the the potted tree probably is going to take its sweet time <laughs> uh maturing cuz it's it's just competing with other varieties and you know it's just not something i think is probably for the best and i like if there's a variety I really, really like, um, I got to have it in the ground. I think that's going to be just me going forward. Um, there are some varieties that I've learned this year that it really should just stay in a pot and they perform way better in a pot. And um, those are the varieties that I'm going to be either grafting this year um, or trying to make copies of just exclusively for growing them in a pot, which are... Smith, Hated the Argentile, and Nishia Black, UC Davis. So we'll get to those in a minute. Um, but LSU Purple, I think, without a doubt, is at least, at the very least, it's a keeper. But I don't know exactly. And maybe I should downgrade it. Probably because I want to keep this list so pure. You know, I want to keep these recommendations so pure. I mean, these are basically as good as it gets. So if I'm not totally sure about something then I'm probably going to downgrade it for now and I can always add it back if for whatever reason any of these keepers here I change my mind on them and they start to impress me then I can always upgrade them back like a fig that I am quite hopeful for is Blanche de Duce Cezanne you know um, in fact I, I would even probably venture to guess and say that LSU Purple belongs in this category as a runner-up so does probably the Blanche de Duce Cezanne. I haven't really put a whole lot of time into, you know, these two lists just yet. But um, this is basically, you know, very easily you could just make an argument that anybody having any of the figs in the keeper list, you'd be like, oh, you're ha you should be really happy to have these. Um, runners up. And maybe even White Triana should be over here. I don't know why I have it in that list but the runners up are the figs that I basically have said oh well these are so good that or these have the highest potential to basically break into this list here you know uh, these are the guys that I think again have that potential to eventually break into this this category um, more so than the others you know the keepers for the most part we know almost everything there is to know about them um, i do think strawberry verte has a chance as well um i guess sultane has a pretty good shot because we still don't know a whole lot about it um
Yeah, I think I like this. I think I like this uh, this list here that's going on. Negra de Agde, I guess we can move over here too, because again, I still don't know everything there is to know about that fig. Um, yeah, so these are the keepers, and I would say, again, if you had any of these varieties, you probably are. Um, again, you just can't go wrong with these. And then here's the varieties that I would consider the runners-up, the figs that have the most potential. As I mentioned already, Ponte Trace is in this list. Black Celeste is in this list. I just haven't had enough experience with Black Celeste myself to be able to definitively say it belongs in this category. Colonel Lippmann's, obviously. Del's, Del's Ermitons was a little bit disappointing this year, and maybe I could even downgrade it to a keeper. I'm not sure. Uh, Fico Salame has got some great potential. It's got an elongated oval shape, produces early. So it's got good rain resistance, um, good split resistance. Don't know about the flavor just yet, right? Um, Fane, similar story. Got everything that you would probably want, but how does it taste? Um, Grease de St. Jean. I've had some issues with different strains of Grease de St. Jean, and one of them might end up being superior. Uh, Le Bourgeoisie, this is a potential replacement for the Col de Doms. I probably think of this in the same way I think of Sucret, you know, in the same way I think about uh, Blanche de Duce Cezanne. Um, there's a number of these different Col de Doms that I just haven't necessarily been, you know, this is the Col de Dom replacement. Uh, because really the true Col de Dom replacement that beats all of them so far is De La Roca. Um, to finish off this runners up list real quick, you got LSU Scott's Yellow, which is similar to LSU Huye, but could potentially be better. I don't know. And some of these LSU figs like Tiger, Huye, and Champagne, they are without a doubt keepers. I've seen some splitting this year, some large cracking this year, which really turned me off of them. And they were let's say, in this particular list over here, but uh, they've sort of disappointed me. And LSU Huye really disappointed me more than um, than the others because that was one that really filled in a particular flavor category that now I just don't have filled with any of these figs that I would consider in this top tier. Um, Albo's similar, has a larger eye, ripens extremely early, um, because of that large eye and the, the round shape that it has, it just is not ideal, I think, for more humid places. Um, Sucret, I think, is not the most complex fig. It has really good drying capabilities, which is a huge plus, but it does split every once in a while. And I don't know why that is. Um, seems a little bit more sensitive to moisture. Bode has certainly written in his book that he agrees, so why would I disagree with Bode? Um, yeah, there's just some downsides to this that I think maybe these other guys have a slight edge on Sucret. And again, I'd be super excited and happy to have it. Same thing with Vila de Bordeaux. I mean, to then have Vila de Bordeaux not in this list is just crazy. Um, Ron de Bordeaux, Paradiso Ciro, one of the best figs I grow in terms of flavor. Just has that larger eye, uh, not an ideal shape to it. Um, Negretta reminds me a lot of a Ron de Bordeaux that doesn't split, but the flavor is not as good. It's not as complex. Um, LDA, Long de Dute, perfect, perfect fig. In fact, uh, my friend Big Bill is a huge proponent of this fig. Um, although some of mine split this year, um, we'll have to see how it does, honestly, because some of these in-ground trees, you know, they have more potential to do a lot better than they did this year. The older they get as they dig themselves in, these big rain events won't affect them. You know, it's going to be interesting to see how an in-ground white Triana does, an in-ground strawberry verte does, um, an in-ground negra de Agde. I mean, there's so many possibilities, I think, with Long to Do, all the LSU varieties, um, even Paradiso Ciro I have in the ground to see how that one does. Um, it's just going to be, I think, fantastic to see maybe even some of these keepers being upgraded again into this this list. So 
Um, I kind of, I think it's just driving the point home of like, hey, you know, they're keepers, but it doesn't mean they're bad figs. You know, these are out of thousands of varieties far superior to the others. So, you know, some people may look at this and say, oh, well, they ain't, they ain't any good, you know. The differences between some of these figs here is just not really all that big between the differences between these. There really isn't a huge, huge difference. Um, you know, without a doubt, Verdino del Nord is, I think, far superior to any other fig I grow. And then number two is Neruccio de Elba. And between the two of them, there is a clear difference, a clear uh, ranking order there between the rest of them. So... Um, yeah, it's just kind of a little bit insane in that sense. But the difference is, let's say, between, I don't know, uh, some of these figs in here, let's say, between some of the keepers. It's just such a slight edge at that point. Um, I wouldn't drive yourself insane for trying to find, you know, each and every one of these varieties that I have listed over here. Let's continue on. Uh, Marsa Lazy is a fig that has extreme drying capabilities, just like Verdino del Nord and Elba. Uh, looking forward to that one. Uh, Medieval Yavor has proven itself to have a nice shape, um, a nice size to it. It's kind of a smaller fig. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Vertolino, but not. Um, almost like a smaller Dalmati. Interest it's pretty interesting, that fig. Uh, Nefiach, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. Has got some good potential as well. Noir de Malone, hugely underrated, not talked about fig. Great drying capabilities, good shape, good rain resistance, good flavor. Um, it should be a better, even should be a better version of Sultane, and I highly respect Sultane as it is. Um, there's also, let's see here, uh, the Pastelier, which we've talked a lot about. Pecchioli Bianco, which has got great drying capabilities as well. Pissoluto, which has the perfect shape, great flavor, um, probably has some drying capabilities as well. I don't know. Ponte Tresa, we've mentioned. Uh, Rosa Dagoni, this is a new one that I think has some good potential. I don't know. Tolosa, this is a Thierry fig that I think is showing some good promise in terms of its shape, its size, its flavor, its productivity, its vigor. It's got a lot of good things going for it. Unghiarolo is a very Ita early Italian fig. Should have good flavor to it. Verdino Giacomo seems to have good drying capabilities, really good attributes. Verdolino, uh, a similar fig to Salame almost, and uh, Medieval Yavor. This one I think has a lot, a lot, a lot of potential. Um, similar to like Black Celeste, where I think those two probably have the highest chance maybe out of any of these figs, maybe Pecciolo's up there, Pissoluto's up there, Malone's up there, Ungirolo. Um, there's also a fig called Verdone that comes from Nikki. It's not your typical Verdone. It's got black skin to it. And uh, not a whole lot of people grow this. I don't know anyone that's growing it. I don't know, even know anyone that fruited it. I thought it was a Smyrna, but it ripened some figs here this year that were actually really quite impressive really surprised actually it had a good shape to it. it didn't have any cracking in it the flavor was good really looking forward to that more of those figs the white madeira number one that's an obvious choice a lot of people love lsu purple blanche to do saison potential cold Dom replacement you got white triana uh, which is a really good fig uh, the only thing I worry about is the hang time. And we had a review that we did recently, and we've talked about this fig recently. We gave away cuttings recently from this variety. And I'm almost very tempted, believe it or not, to just stick it back in uh, in this mid-season section here because it really is that good. Uh, Strawberry Verte. It's uh, one of those Adriatic types that seems a bit on the earlier side and doesn't seem to split as often. It's very productive, very vigorous. It's a great choice. Sultane, there's a huge amount of information on this fig. Very reliable. Um, Mid-season, great characteristics about it. Negra de Agde, 
Um, has a texture a lot like the Col de Dom, so that's really a great thing. I've heard that it doesn't split and deals well with the rain, but I think I did have one this year that did split, and that is not a good sign. Um, and there's the Black Reek from my friend Dennis, which uh, we're keeping an eye on very closely. So to go back to the best varieties here, because we skipped around a lot, unfortunately. We talked about Azores Dark, Celeste, Campaneri, Malta Black, Mora de Caneva. Now there's Neruciola de Elba, which we said, that's our number two. And the reason why it's our number two, and it's a clear number two, it's not even close, because it has those superior drying capabilities. Better than any of the other figs. Actually, it's probably even slightly better than Verdino del Nord. Um, although Verdino del Nord, I would consider number one because the flavor is incredible. Um, it has that superior rain resistance, the almost the best drying capabilities, great shape to it. It's almost indestructible. It's almost unbeatable. Um, I think it ripens mid-season, but I really don't know for sure. Uh, there's also, let's say here, we talked about the Borgia Soak Grease, which by all accounts is a fantastic fig. Um, I'm hoping more of them have a more pyroform shape to it. I know a lot of people said your Ciolato, but I really want the shape to straighten itself out. Um, it seems to be rather um, variable in its shape, which is not good. And as the shape becomes more flat, the more I worry about the split, the splitting on that particular fig. Um, we also have the Ishea Black UC Davis, which we've actually yet to try, but by all accounts, it's extremely, extremely good. Um, it's not the latest fig in the world. It has really great, I, I think I've already mentioned that, really good taste um, qualities to it. It doesn't probably have nearly as much problems with rain and other issues that you might consider. Um, really looking forward to that. And I've grafted a number of trees. Finally, we have some established Ishea black trees to, uh, to propagate from and to hopefully have fruit off of next year. The uh, Rosalino is kind of like, I almost think of it as an upgraded Hardy Chicago. So it's almost like an upgraded Azores Dark and upgraded Malta Black. Um, it has better drying capabilities than them all, and that's typically what it's used for in Tuscany, where it's widely grown. And you have to think, well, if it's got the better drying capabilities, then it's going to be in the same class as something like Verdino del Nord and Neruccio de Elba. I don't think to that extent that the drying capabilities are, but it's up there. Um, you know, Campaneri has got some great drying capabilities to it um, as well. And, you know, the drying capabilities, I think, really puts it ahead of the other figs. Um, there's also Zafiro, which we've talked a lot about in the past. And I just got actually a tree from a friend that I killed all of my trees. I had three Zafiro trees, <laughs> killed every single one of them. It seems to be just a very difficult variety to deal with at first. Um, I did have my grafted Zafiro on a pretty established rootstock that ended up dying. The rootstock died and therefore the actual variety itself died. And it was just, it was very sad to see. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm glad to have it back, honestly. It's probably the most complex honey fig I've ever had. Um, fantastic rain resistance, split resistance, productive, vigorous. It's got it all. Um, and there's two figs here I really want to mention before we go on to the next category. Because some of the best tasting figs I have um, are these two here. And it's hard to really beat them. I think it's really difficult in terms of flavor and if it wasn't for the flavor I probably wouldn't be growing them because these varieties I really I really think they need to be grown in pots um, they just you know it's not like hate of the Argentile shouldn't be grown in or it shouldn't be grown in the ground I just think that Hate of the Argentile is very difficult to establish, like Ishea Black, UC Davis, and therefore should be grafted until you can get a really healthy cutting, propagate that healthy cutting, and then you can plant it in the ground. 
which actually is what the deal is now with my hate of the Argentile and maybe will be what the deal is with my Ashia Black in the future. The alternative is you can plant one of those two varieties, Ashia Black, hate of the Argentile, in the ground and keep rejuvenation pruning it every year. Eventually it will become healthy and you'll be happy and you could have them in the ground. In fact, I do have an Ashia Black in the ground. I, my plan is to get a Hadev in the ground. I do have a Smith in the ground, but I just genuinely think between the, th the three of them, Aishia Black mostly should be grafted, Hadev should be grafted, and Smith just doesn't seem to be doing well in this particular system I have it in. It really needs the widest canopy <laughs> that you can give it. Um, it doesn't necessarily like to, to have a dense canopy, and if it is dense, it just won't fruit. So it's really, really important to get sort of Smith established um, before it really can become very productive. And as I say, they're very, very good fruits. Uh, Hative reminds me a lot of Smith, but it's more cherry-like, more acidic. Smith has some acidity to it, but it's like a more complex version of Azores Dark. Um, maybe a more complex version of even Campaneri more complex than, let's say, Borgia Soak Grease, potentially. Um, it's really got the flavor going for it. And I would say, if I had to rate them all on flavor, I would say the top fig I grow in terms of flavor is actually De La Roca. Um, it is the best tasting fig. And then, um, you know, you probably, I'd have to put the Cold Adams in there. But below that is probably something called De La Senora Hivernenka. Uh, and then I would put probably Smith and Hative right behind it with Verdino del Nord right behind that as well. Um, so, you know, those are probably the best tasting figs I have. Not only are they as good, are they super, super good, but they also have really ridiculous characteristics to them. Um, you know, the, the both of them just do incredibly well in rain. Um, in these humid conditions, it's very difficult to beat Hate of the Argentile and Smith. Um, they don't have the highest drying cap. They don't really have much drying capabilities at all, as I've been able to at least figure out. Uh, you know, maybe they do, and I just haven't let them ripen that long. But you know, they're they're sort of in a class in, of their own in terms of rain resistance. I think you know Celeste is probably right up there with it. Um, it's just hard to really beat them for rain resistance um, in their own little way, I think, uh, if that makes any sense. But, yeah, De La Roca, moving on to the late varieties. It is the best tasting fig I have. It, it's basically a cold adam that has drying capabilities. So it doesn't split, has the good shape, doesn't crack. It's a more intensely flavored cold adam with the perfect texture that you're looking for. It's amazing. Um, probably the biggest recommendation I think behind Verdino del Nord and Neruccio de Elba, that one's probably number three. Um, just because it tastes so phenomenal and it also has all those characteristics, you know, black Madeira tastes amazing. And I think everybody should try that fig, but there's just so many issues with it. It's so late. It splits. It just you, you grow. I, I basically have a black Madeira in a pot to maybe get one to five good tasting fruits all year, you know. And De La Roca, although it is a late fig, probably just as late, maybe a little bit earlier than the black Madeira. At least it's not gonna split, you know. At least you're gonna be able to eat it. You're not gonna get SWD damage. It's just far, far, far superior with the same awesome flavor. I mean, it's not the same, but it's still that same awesome eating experience that you want in a extremely tasty variety. You know, that's sort of what people rave about Black Madeira for, um, is for that flavor. And then De La Senora Hibernenka, this is the latest variety that I would recommend. Um, you know, I probably would put Black Madeira in this very late category. Um, if you're getting any later than De La Senora Hibernenka, I think you're kind of making a mistake. Um, so let me just show you on Ponza's website. He's got some varieties here. He's got all of them, 
that you can look at. Here's uh, De La Roca we're going to look at. And there's also Hivernenka, which you can see the exact dates of when these things ripen in Mallorca. And, you know, De La Roca is September 7th, which is basically around the same time as the Col de Dames. So it's not much earlier. De La Senora Hivernenka is very, very late. And it's 20, the 22nd of September. So this, you could make an argument, is right along the same time as, you know, Black Madeira as an example. And uh, for that reason, it's difficult to deal with. And um, that's why I only have 5% of my collection is going to be very late varieties like De La Senora Hibernanca. But with all of the season extension that I have here, uh, I think it's worth it. It has the shortest hang time of any fig I have. It's like a three or four day. Really, ideally, it's like five or six. But you could pick it at day three or four and still have a high quality fruit, which is insane. And that even goes all the way into the fall for most of the fall. So even if it's cold, it's still actually really quite tasty. It's really ins insane, actually, that fig. It's got high rain resistance, high split resistance. One downside is that it does crack, and the cracks are huge. So um, you get really bad fall weather. You may have it actually split open on the side, and that could not be good. But um, for all intents and purposes, it's the best fig I've ever seen that ripens late and will put up with the really bad fall weather here in this climate. Um so if you're going to have a very late fig, that would be the one. Again, I probably I don't recommend having many of these, but we did plant one in the ground to uh, because we're going to have such large season extension this year that it just to me makes a whole lot of sense to cover my bases here. Maybe there is some room and potential for a fig like that um, that will still perform, let's say, even now when most other figs are kind of done. So I think that's... To me, super, super interesting. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the breakdown here of the, the best fig varieties I grow. I mean, that's it's really quite simple. We've narrowed it down to six, seven. Um, you know, we're looking at 15 varieties here, which is kind of insane. Um, that we went from hundreds. I've grown literally hundreds of varieties, and we've narrowed it down to 15 really solid choices. So, uh, you know, people said I couldn't do it. Uh, people said I wouldn't do it, but I did it. Um, and now at this point, it's really just getting rid of some varieties uh, as we do every single year. I probably get rid of maybe close to a third of my varieties every single season, every season. I've been doing it since 2017. And I have coal list posts that I've made since 2017. I missed one year in there. I think I missed 2018. Or I didn't do a write-up, but really every single year I've gotten rid of a third of my varieties, and it's pretty significant. Um, so let's talk about those right now, and why we're getting rid of them um, in as short of amount of information as I can give you guys. Uh, we will do a write-up probably at some point on these and post that this information here on the blog of all of these different sort of this information that we just put out. Um, in this this podcast we'll probably write this up in written form and maybe even have a little bit more information and a, a, a better breakdown of this um, so if we go here to our other sheet we can see what what I have to do in my yard and things that I'm planning to do things like air layers and um, recovering rootstock and up potting things and down potting things and uh, making copies of certain varieties, which varieties I intend to plant in the ground. Here's a, a list right here. These are some varieties I think I should plant in the ground. Um, I have not entirely decided on everything I'm going to plant just yet. Um, and then here's some varieties I think would probably make some sense planting them in the ground at some point in the future, but I'm sort of waiting for more information on them. Um, we have some varieties that I'm going to dig up um, for various different reasons. Um, I'm kind of reluctant, actually, to dig up some LTA because uh, they really do just put out a ton of fruit, and it's like a huge amount of fruit in terms of 
you know, not just, I guess, how productive it is, but also the size of the fruit and also how well it does here. You know, it's probably one of the better choices uh, that you can grow probably in this climate in terms of if you're trying to sell fruit, it's probably one of the better choices. Um, you can maybe make an argument for like yellow long neck or golden rainbow, but I haven't necessarily been, you know, getting as much information on those just yet as I need to make a better informed decision yet on those. But LDA probably is just a spot on choice. And I don't know, honestly, if I should really rip those out. Uh, white Madeira, we're going to plant a white Madeira in its place. So it's like, you know, not really ripping this one out. Um, I'd rather have it in the ground than not. Um, some of these varieties we just don't know enough about, like Vasilika Black. I just, I don't know any, much about them, and I think I'd rather have other varieties in the ground in its place, and I'll grow Vasilika Black in, let's say, a pot instead. Um, let's talk mostly, though, about the, the coal list here because there's really a huge amount of figs this year. Uh, let's see, three... 50, so there's basically 47 varieties of figs that I'm getting rid of this year. Um, that's a pretty big list. I think in other years it's been somewhere around 40, 30 to 40 varieties. This year it's in, it's almost 50, so that's a pretty big list. Um, and I can accurately make and feel good about these decisions because I have such a great list of varieties as it is that I can confidently say I'm not going to miss these other varieties, you know? Um, so I guess as I go along further through this, the easier these decisions become and the more frequent these decisions become. Um, Adams seems like a really great fig, actually. And a lot of these figs, actually, that I'm calling are great figs. They seem like really great varieties. Um... Again, it's just that these other varieties have such an edge on them in this climate that it doesn't make sense to grow these. It just doesn't. Um, based off what I've learned about the shape, the rain resistance, the drying capabilities, all of that. Um, you know, Adam, as I said, um, is a great tasting fig, and I haven't even tasted it yet. Uh, but I know from a lot of information that exists on this variety, it's actually a really popular fig. Uh, it splits, and it has some of the Palmata genes in it, I believe, as well. So for that reason, I have to get rid of it. If it splits, it can't stay. Um, Baccarino, not the tastiest fig here. It takes a while to mature, and I did have some that actually had some really good potential for the flavor. I just um, was not really impressed with it. I think it really should be grown somewhere else. I think it should probably be grown... Maybe somewhere in California with the wasp. It's extremely early and very productive. Puts out a lot of fruit. I think there's a lot of pluses to that fig. Bial, I think there's also a lot of pluses to this one, but it's split. Uh, I was really interested to, to find out the flavor and um, figure out if it maybe fit into a different honey fig category that would impress me. Um, some of the hardy Chicago types I really just wasn't impressed with this year, like Black Greek from Marius and Novid's Dark Greek. My Azores Dark and Malta Black just blow those figs away. And I'm sure maybe if I gave them more time, I probably would see more potential in them. But for now, um, I really just was not impressed with them. And I thought I would be, I thought I should have been more impressed than I was. So I'm kind of seeing that as a good so a bad sign, and I'm kind of getting rid of it. Um, but in all honesty, in the future, I, I would like to do some sort of Hardy Chicago trial and trial so many of the different types, grow them in the ground for like three to five years and see really which ones came out ahead of the others. Um, I bet you even Azores Dark and Malta Black may not come out ahead. I bet you there's probably one that, is better than um, than those two. It's just how much years and how much time are you willing to dedicate to that particular trial? It's kind of nuts. Um, Black Madeira UC Davis is 
just very late. And again, it's like that fig, I get one to five figs off of the, in every year that are good and the rest of them split or I don't even get to eat them. So I don't see much point in it. Um, I do have a Black Madeira KK in the ground and I will keep that for probably a very long time. Um, Black Province. And you know what, with the help of the season extension of having it in ground, it's probably gonna split less and it's also going to get off to an early start. So having them having that black or KK isn't going to be a waste. It's not like I'm not going to be able to harvest anything from it. It's actually going to be a much better fig than if it could ever be in a pot. Black Province. Uh, this is a Violet de Bordeaux type. I just wasn't really all that impressed with it. I know Big Bill is a fan of it. Blava Campanera. This is a fig we grafted onto. And the fig I grafted onto it, I think, is Luzano, if I'm not mistaken wasn't too impressed by that but it, it's got good qualities to it like it's an early variety it's pro, it's super productive um the shape is just not ideal it's round it has the potential to split and i don't necessarily know how great the flavor uh is i mean and will be here in my climate i think it i probably got to pass it up but Blava Campanera, as the rootstock, I'm not a huge fan of either. I think there's actually some good potential there. And on Pons' website, you can look at it and read it. And if you have his book, um, he actually speaks quite highly of it, guys. Um, hold on a second. Okay, yeah, this this one here. It means bell, I guess. And it's not like the it's the latest fig either. It doesn't have uh, the worst rain resistance, but it does have only a medium resistance, he says, to splitting. So that's not a good sign. And you can even see in this photo, this one here is split, and I think this one looks kind of funky to it. Um, I don't know. I'm not too high. I was never really high on this fig. In fact, even I think in our last cold list that we did last year or maybe in the year prior it was on the list so i'm adding it to the list again because i was reluctant to get rid of it but i actually think i was probably right in the end to get rid of it well that campos i think it just it doesn't it's just not a fig for this climate it's actually really good it's really thick um it's got a great texture to it it's got good flavor to it uh this is a type of black Madeira that a friend of mine found and I'm not really into the black Madeiras and pots right I'm, I'm sticking with the black Madeira KK and the, the Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross may even just replace them all at some point um, and, and I also have the Italian 258 in the ground as well so I don't really need more of these types the Bordesote Blanca Negra and the Bordesote Rosa I was kind of high on those from ponds for a while but They've largely have been very unproductive. I haven't even tasted them. Um, I hear they're very good. I have no doubts they're very good. I bet you Border Soap Blanc and Negra is very good, actually. Um, probably as good as Black Madeira, maybe better. Um, but I just don't think they're for this this particular climate. Probably Border Soap Blanc and Negra is a fig that's really well worth growing for people in, um, in a really well-suited climate. Brockton Greeks, another hardy Chicago type, just was not impressed by it. Uh, Capole Kurt Negra. It's a very good fig, guys. Perfect texture. Um, it's got great flavor to it. It just splits. It's got the wrong shape. Rojoto Masseria. This thing hasn't ripened any figs. I like the fig, though. I wish it was common. But I don't know. I think it might be a Smyrna, Colden on Blanca Negra. It's got a flat shape to it. Odd that it could be considered a Col de Dom. Good flavor, good texture. I just, that shape, it just doesn't going to work here. Cotillo Verdal, I don't think has produced anything for me. I'm also just like, whatever, you know. It, I'm sure it tastes great. I just can't really see the potential of it really doing well here, knowing what I know now. I just don't think that fig probably is really worth growing. The Trace of Splace, it does split as well. And um, it's a good tasting fig. It's very, very early. I consider it probably in the same category as Ronde Bordeaux. But I think I'd rather just have Ronde Bordeaux. And even then, Ronde Bordeaux is 
you know, it's just a keeper. I think they trace his place as a keeper, by the way. Early Violet. Uh, early Violet. Whatever Early Violet I have, it's not early. <laughs> it ain't early. I don't know what that fig is, and I'm probably not going to sell it because I don't know what it is. And it doesn't seem to me to be worth it. Um, yeah. Ubon. This fig is also, it seems like it's mislabeled. Uh, Ubon should be a pastel air type, and this is actually a Vitato. Figu Jean, very early fig, just like the Trace of Splace, but it, it is flat, and it splits very easily. Galicia Negra splits. Great tasting fig. I love that fig. Getting rid of my Italian 258 in, the pot, in a pot. And actually, this shouldn't even be here because I'm not technically culling it. I still have the one in the ground that we're keeping. The Iraqi Palmata Hybrid. Um, this one, I think, would make great rootstock. Um, it grows well. Um, the fruit seems to need to hang for a long time, and I just don't like that. To really develop the full flavor, it needs time to mature. It just has too many requirements, I think. Um, I'm sure somewhere it's good, but not here. Aishia Black, this is a uh, Violet de Bordeaux that I'm um, just getting rid of some copies, some extras I have. Um, is Mir, in fact, I think I'm not even really calling this either. We're just selling this. Um, because I am keeping one of them, I think in in a pot, I'm keeping my potted, yeah. Izmir and Izmir not, just not impressed with them. Uh, Izmir not. People say it's like Colded on Blanc. It ain't. It's not even close. Izmir drops every fig. Jade. Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful fig, but I think it belongs in a climate that has the wasp. Uh. It just doesn't do all that well here, I think, without pollination. I think that's a huge, unfortunately, a requirement because I really would like to grow that fig. And i just not been impressed with it. Little Ruby, it's just so small. And I think we even had this on our coal list last year, and I never dug it up. Luzano, we talked about. Morris Niger, the Morris Niger mulberry, although it's not a fig, it's in a pot, and to be honest with you, it's not worth it. It's just not worth growing a mulberry in a pot, um, especially a Morris Niagara. Although it's very tasty, um, just not very impressed with it, and it belongs in a climate that it can actually grow in. Uh, Moscatel Preto, very flat figs this year, which is quite different than other people I've seen. Uh, because it's so flat, it's split a lot. The flavor is good, but it splits. Yellow niches, um, very, very early fig. Not a huge fan of the flavor, and I wish it would mature finally. I think it's got the Palmata gene in it, and those Palmata figs just take their time, man, to really mature. It's kind of annoying. Um, Osborne Prolific. A similar story to be all I just I was hoping for an interesting flavor I like the fig I've, I've even tasted the fig it's a fa fantastic tasting fig very figgy um, it just doesn't produce well here um, it needs a less dense canopy um, I don't remember really what the story is with this fig actually I don't remember what's wrong with it in fact I'm not even totally sure if I even ripen some of them um, I may not have, but I'm getting tired. If it didn't ripen figs, I'm getting tired of that. Sanguinato, I'm pretty sure, is a Smyrna. Um, Simon, number one, from my friend Simon, just keeps dropping figs. I'm getting tired of that. Sweet Joy is not a very productive fig, although very, very good. Texas BA1 is a similar to Smith, but not Smith. And um, it just that doesn't produce, and it's in the ground. And why have... A different strain of Smith, I guess. It doesn't produce. I don't know. Uh, Preto de Torres Novas. People love this fig for some reason, but it's super early. It's super early, but it's very. Um, it splits a lot. 
and that splitting really the SWD loved this fig this year. It reminds me a lot of Teramo in that sense. And I'm just not a big fan of Teramo or Brandon Street or Nebo or any of these early round shaped figs that just split all the time. Uh, there's Victoria. This is a black mission type I've learned, similar to Galicia Negra. It's got great flavor to it. It just um, is late. It splits. Um, finally was productive for me. I, I don't know. Just not a big fan of it. GM172. Um, the flavor I couldn't get behind. People have said it's good. I just can't get behind it. Um, not a big fan of this fruit. Uh, Planera splits, known splitter. Finally got to taste it. Just decided to move on. Rosa de Triani, I don't even know. I had, I didn't think I ripened anything from this. I just don't think this one's going to be doing well here. I think it's a type of um, brown turkey. Um, Martinenka, this is the non Ramada version. And just looking at Ponza's notes on it. I'm not really all that impressed. Also, the figs I did ripen, they're tasty. It's a highly flavored fig, but uh, again, just because it's highly flavored doesn't mean I should grow it. Um, Fico Love, this fig tends to drop a lot when it's young. Um, I finally did ripen one, and you know I always knew it was true to type, but it just... I don't know. I'm not. I don't know anyone really that's so keen on it, and it didn't produce a whole lot of figs. Doesn't like a dense canopy. Tends to drop. I hear it needs a long hang time. So I don't know. I think I'm kind of making a mistake with that one. To be perfectly honest with you. Black UD10. Never impressed. I'm sure it's really not all that great. Um, makes a great rootstock. I don't know. I don't want to just say it's it's horrible, but. Definitely planting it in the ground, I think, and letting it mature is probably the way to go. And it may need a few years before I can really accurately say, really, if it's good or bad. Aborda Barraquera, I'm still really on the fence about. It's blue, it's beautiful, I'm sure it's tasty. It's late, though, and it's got good rain resistance and split resistance, I've heard, but I'm sure it's not the best. And, uh, Probably not the best fig to be growing here in this climate. So that's kind of here, guys, what we've just uncovered in this short season that we had. And, and um, really the best I could do, I think. Um, it's good, I think, to really talk about the ones you're getting rid of because then it really makes sense when it, income, when it comes to what it is actually you're keeping and why you're keeping it. Because it's not just enough to talk about the good ones. You got to talk about the bad ones because you can't have any good ones unless you have bad ones. You know, you don't even know what's good unless you had bad. So um, it's just, yeah, I think we're making some pretty good decisions, some good progress towards really narrowing this whole thing down. And um, I'm excited for the future, especially for some of these varieties here. I think there is some good potential there, but. This is as pretty solid as it gets at this point. So I want to thank everybody out there here for watching this one. Um, it was a long one and there was a lot of information, but um, I hope you guys got something out of this and and uh, we'll continue trialing the varieties here in Pennsylvania. And I will see everybody soon. All right. Take care and we'll see you guys for next week. All right. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, you got this far, leave us a review. Subscribe to the channel, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, check out our blog, consider supporting us on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. We will talk to you guys again, like I said, next week. Take care, everybody.